Um, it's very nice to be here. This is actually my first SSP, which is quite an interesting fact of our panel. We have two people that work for big publishers, but neither of us have been here before, before this year. Um, so I'm going to talk about, um, in particular, about the implementation of policies and some of the practical things that we've been doing at Springer Nature. Of course, there are lots of things that publishers are doing and experimenting with to encourage data sharing from new types of journal, new types of article, awareness raising, uh, reproducibility processes, checklists, etc., etc. Um, but I'm going to focus on a few specific things to give you a bit more practical insight and actually share some data with you on how that's gone in terms of both benefits but costs as well, because open data are awesome, but they're also not free, so we have to think about both those aspects. So this isn't an advocacy presentation. I'm not here to tell you why open data, data sharing, reproducibility are really important. But I did think it was worthwhile that given many of us work with researchers a lot of the time, we should be interested in evidence. And I often say there are a number of benefits for sharing and publishing research data. So I took the opportunity to evidence a number of these statements. And the first one in particular, I think, is really important. And that's that there's a growing amount of evidence, six papers so far I've found, that show that if you make data available supporting peer-reviewed publications and link them up uh, between repositories and, and those publications, you get more citations, which is, of course, good for the publisher, it's good for the researcher, it's good for the institution. And there are also a number of other important benefits around increasing quality and reproducibility, researcher productivity, return on investment, and also, um, importantly, particularly if we think of medical research, and we, if we can improve the, the robustness of evidence, the completeness of evidence on drugs, for example, then there's a real uh, potential to benefit uh, human health as well. But I won't dwell on that anymore, but I just thought it was important to say that there is a lot of evidence for these benefits we often talk about. Um, there's some also really important context here, um, and that's funder policy. So publishers have an interest in being compliant with funder policy on open access is, is, is a really relevant one. Um, and there are 200 or more policies on open access, and there's a both financial and reputational interest um, and a wider community interest in supporting compliance with open access, and the same is increasingly true for open data. So around 40 funding bodies or more have some kind of requirement for encouraging or, or requiring data sharing as a condition of grants, and I pulled out a few here, NSF, Gates Foundation, etc. In the UK, where I'm from, we have seven research councils, and they have quite a progressive data policy agenda, including the one that I've pulled out at the bottom here, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, that has a requirement in its policy for researchers to provide a statement in their papers. It's called a data availability statement. We'll probably hear that phrase a little, a few times today. So this is a funder that actually requires a section in an article, in much like an acknowledgement or competing interest statement, which we're all now very familiar with. And this is a real practical thing editors and authors and now publishers are having to deal with. So policy is a good incentive for publishers to change their behavior, and it's also an incentive for researchers uh, to change their behavior. Researchers report in surveys, again, I've evidenced these somewhat laboriously, but importantly, um, that funder policy on data um, is a reason why a researcher might want to share their data. However, um, it can also be a reason why they're not sure how to share their data, because I've shown there are 40 or more policies from funders on data sharing, and sadly, journals and publishers aren't doing much better. In fact, historically, the landscape of journal and publisher policy on data sharing is actually quite confused. I'm showing some uh, data here from a, a study done by JISC, uh, and they tried to catalogue journal research data sharing policies. And from a sample of around 250, they actually had to stop their project because they were going to run out of money. They tried to create a database of all the different data sharing policies, but there was a real lack of standards, often unclear what was meant. If a journal says, we encourage, we require, we mandate, how is that actually checked and enforced in the editorial process? What's the practical outcome um, during the peer review process? So there's a lot, uh, historically there's a lot of um, confusion here potentially for researchers and research support staff. So something um, that we've been doing at Springer Nature for uh, the last year or so is a small project to try and introduce a, a standard research data 
policy to all of our journals, ultimately, that publish primary research. So um, we publish around 2,500 journals um, on a variety of business models, editorial models, and society or other kinds of relationships. So it was clear that we couldn't introduce the same kind of policy to every journal. Now, if you want to know much more about this, there's a preprint in the bioarchive that's also going to be published in um, a peer-reviewed journal soon as well. But uh, in summary, um, after some consultation internally and externally, we defined four types of data policy, starting with type one policy, which is quite simple, just encourages sharing of research data, provides information in the guide to authors and in the submission system. It's a second type of policy that encourages sharing and then provision of evidence that data have been shared, again, with these data availability statements. The third type of policy um, you might see at Biomed Central or Nature Journals now, where they actually require a mandatory data availability statement for every paper, and then for certain communities, data sharing is enforced. Finally, we have a fourth type of policy, um, which is typically for very data-focused journals like Scientific Data, which, which I represent. Um, where data have to be open as a condition of submitting to the journal. Peer reviewers have got to have had eyes on the data. The data have all got to be cited uh, in the reference list. So there's actually nine features which I can't go into, but three common themes here is that we're preferencing data sharing in public repositories over supplementary materials because we say there are lots of benefits in that. We'll hear more from repositories later. Um, Data citation is encouraged and, and, and permitted within the style, so citing data sets with DOIs in the reference list. And we also provide uh, publisher support as part of this, so a help desk. So this is simply, it's an email help desk for editors and authors to get in touch with the publisher to receive um, advice on how to implement a policy for their journal, if it's an editor, or how to comply with that policy uh, if you're an author. So commonly, we'll, we will get asked questions from authors who are about to submit to a journal, and they want to know whether or not they have to share their data, or how they describe their availability of their data in one of these data access statements. Um, so we've produced some policy text. We've produced um, some detailed guidance on these data availability statements with a number of published examples, because that, that was very important. We learned we had to provide practical examples covering everything from high energy physics to humanities to try and make it relevant. Um, also, we provide a, a list of recommended repositories, and we're not alone in this. You'll find that Elsevier have a list of repositories, PLOS have a list of repositories, and I'm sure others do as well. So that's been an important practical tool just to encourage better practice and provide information. So how are we doing with this? Um, as of uh, yesterday, around about 1,000 journals, so coming up to half of the Springer Nature portfolio, have adopted one of these four types of policy. Um, that's uh, almost a daily process. Um, we're actually going journal by journal, editor by editor, to have these conversations and, and choose the right policy. Um, but we also think that this is a good opportunity, such as today, but also more widely to have a, a broader conversation about data policy, the implementation steps, the practicalities. So we've made um, the policies themselves available open access. And um, if this is an area that you're also interested in, um, there's a Research Data Alliance, RDA, interest group um, that's engaging funders, institutions, and other publishers where we're, we're taking an even wider look at, at what the standards could or should be on, on data policy. Um, I mentioned that we've been trying to measure costs as well as benefits of, of implementing data policies. So we um, did a small scale study, which um, I actually have some more data that I need to crunch in my inbox because um, we've extended it. But um, so four of the nature journals, I can actually unblind this now, they're all nature, nature journals. Um, they introduced a policy, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, um, of requiring data availability statements um, around a year ago. And so what I asked the editors to do was to self-report in minutes how much extra time it took them to get that extra content into the paper for around two months for every paper that they handled. And so we have four journals here. One is um, neuroscience, uh, and then we have nature physics, um, and then next over we have um, cell biology and then geoscience. So what you can see here is the average or medium is around about nine or 10 minutes. And I can actually tell you that when we've looked at newer data, editors are getting faster. It's more like about seven minutes with a larger sample size. Um, but what's interesting is that the, the nature physics there, the second column is a lot faster. 
on average to get this information into the paper. So we might wonder why that is. So with a bit further analysis, um, I had the pleasure of reading all of the data availability statements and then coding them to um, three or four main types. So with this kind of section in a paper, this kind of statement, one tends to see about three or four different flavors. One is that the data are available on request. Um, second is that the data might be included with the article, so with the supplementary materials. Or third, that the data is actually in a public repository. So there's some extra information, there's a link to an external knowledge resource there as well. And we also, um, um, at the Nature Journals, have um, figure source data, but that, that's quite specific. But what's interesting and what should be quite clear here is that proportionally, in physical sciences A, Nature Physics, um, this journal, many more brief authors were saying that data is available on request, rather than providing links and other information that might need checking. So that tells us that when data aren't publicly available, maybe there is a, a time benefit there, um, but that's a really useful practical thing that we can now use to have conversations with editors and tailor um, how we implement these policies depending on the, the community. Um, but just to be clear, data on reasonable requests, while it might not be the most robust approach, can actually be very reasonable if you're a high energy physicist and you go to the Large Hadron Collider and produce petabytes of data. It might be unreasonable um, to share that with someone online immediately. Another key point that after doing this, we actually were comfortable with the extra work and now the policy is rolled out to, to actually all of the nature journals. Um, last couple of slides from me, two or three slides. So. Um, I mentioned already that um, data on reasonable request is, is maybe a, a reasonable starting point for policy, but there was some great work done by Tim Vines three or four years ago that actually looked at the effectiveness of different approaches to research data policy. It's the first reference on the slide, which probably you can't read. Um, but what that found is that if you really want data to be available for the long term, then you don't just need a policy. That policy needs to be policed and enforced, and you need to have a repository with which you can work to make sure everyone can actually make their data available, provide a link in their paper. And that might be relatively straightforward if you have a journal that has a, quite a narrow focus or maybe has a good relationship with a, um, a, a general repository from which we'll hear later. But not all journals have that. So we're conducting another experiment at the moment as to whether or not, as a publisher, we can make it easier for uh, journals to uh, make their data available in the, uh, for researchers to make their data available in the same, um, during the same process as publishing their articles. So it's what we're calling this data support services pilot. Uh, what happens here is when researchers submit their papers, if they're interested to make their data available or perhaps required to do so from their funder, um, they have an optional service where they can then privately and securely send uh, larger data files to the publisher to have those managed and then published alongside their article and ensure that there's a bi-directional link between the two objects. Um, very simply, it looks a bit like this. So the researcher, once they answer a couple of questions to determine that they don't have human data or they don't have data that should have gone into GenBank or one of the very obvious community repositories, they can drag and drop onto, this is a Figshare power, power platform, um, tell us who they are, what their manuscript ID is, and then um, hopefully some of the efforts, some of the load, some of the concerns researchers actually have about sharing their data, about time, resources, skills, um, is taken off them. And we'll see whether or not this does lead to greater data sharing, because this is you know, one of the things that we really want. So, finally, I just wanted to, to share some lessons learned because, you know, we're trying to be practical about these things. So this is a, you know, a long-term project that um, we'll be working on for months to come, I'm sure. Um, and so what have we learned? I think you have to um, keep it simple and achievable. So we have four types of policies. Will the first type of policy lead to greater data sharing? Probably not that much. But is it a great way to start the conversation with researchers or disciplines who haven't previously engaged with the idea of data sharing? Absolutely it is. And we'll be working with them to see what resources or support we can provide to, to actually enable journals to, to take a further step if, that, if that's appropriate for their community. Um, other things, you know, general, general good practice with projects consulting with stakeholders, you know, the librarians, the editors, the funding bodies as well are also important because we're all trying to um, move in the same direction with regards to policy on data. Um, really important to show examples relevant to disciplines. One of the most valuable things we did was actually go and create 
paper-specific data statements for physicists and for um, hum um, uh, social scientists to really try and make it relevant. Um, and also important to work with your early adopters, journals that they're willing to do pilots and, and, and trials. And um, you know, we all have to deal with often different systems, different websites, so do be, do be prepared for that and also be prepared to, to get your hands dirty as a project manager and really help work through some of the, some of the details. Um, and then finally, something that we'll, we'll see whether or not it's useful, if we really want to, to take um, really strong steps to data sharing, then we do need um, not just guidance and information, but we may actually need integrated tooled services and repositories to help make that happen. Thanks.